and welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Stay at Home Speaker Series. Today's program is Bats of Hawk Mountain with Dr. Aaron Haynes, certified wildlife biologist and associate professor of conservation biology at Millersville University. Hey, how are you doing? I'm glad everybody's here today. Thanks so much for joining us today, Aaron. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, get started. Um, so what I was going to do is going to share my screen uh, with everybody at home. Um, and uh, let me go ahead and get that set up for everyone. And of course, Jamie will be there to make sure I don't mess anything up, which is always a nice thing to have as somebody to guide you. <laughs> you totally got this. <laughs> so um, is that showing up okay, Jamie? Yeah, that looks, that looks great. Excellent. All right, well, thank you everybody for showing up this evening. It's Friday, so let's do some little, little fun, a little laid back, a little bit interesting. Um, right now we're on the summer season, and so bats are out and about. This is their prime time of year. And so what I wanna kinda get into is some of the research we've been doing with bats in Pennsylvania, a unique project that we've been doing with bats in um, Hawk Mountain. And then, you know, obviously a little bit of background information and then take any questions you may all have about the work that I'm doing. So with a research project, as with most research projects, especially if it's statewide in scale, you've got a team. And I just wanted to acknowledge the bat survey team, especially Carter Farmer, who did a great job of putting together a lot of these slides for this presentation. Uh, she's an undergraduate research student at the Applied Conservation Lab, and she's been doing a lot of great work, uh, actually working with citizen science and doing bat surveys in Lancaster. Nicole has actually been doing a lot of data analysis for a lot of the bat calls in the state and uh, helping put in some manuscripts together. So I definitely want to acknowledge them. And the rest of the team consists of other undergraduate research students and people from bat conservation and management. And of course, those are the key folks, but everybody helps in. So all the land managers from all the different parks and all the cool nature areas that we've been through throughout the state, they've been very helpful. And the funding for this project was provided by the Kittatiddy Ridge Coalition with Pennsylvania Audubon and Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. They've done a great job of supporting us with their work, as well as Millersville University itself has done a great job supporting me and my undergraduate research students. And that's what's kind of the cool thing here is this isn't, you know, our undergraduate students have really stepped up their game. So a lot of the uh, results I'm showing you is efforts put together by them. And even this PowerPoint I'm showing you is efforts put together by undergraduate research students, which is really cool. So let's go ahead and get started. And the first thing, let's talk about bats. Believe it or not, bats make up 20% of all mammals. You gotta remember, mammals include bats, to whales, to moles, to monkeys, to us. So it's a diverse group. And so like one in five animals is a bat, or mammals, sorry, is a bat. And you don't think of them as being that numerous, but they really are, especially in the tropics. Now we've never really had a great relationship with bats, as you see here. This is a, a fruit bat that you finally find more in the tropics. Most of the early relationships we've had with bats have actually been a bit more intense. Um, the research in bats has been around for decades. Historically, the public perception of bats has been pretty negative scary ugly rats with rings that are going to come and attack your hair and suck your blood. Um, not necessarily true, but it, it makes for great fiction and it sells. Um, it certainly does. And so we have these negative relationships, you know, with the, you know, the way they look, um, you know, the transmission of potentially disease, which has actually been overblown, especially with the COVID thing. People are afraid of bats, but Again, that negative relationship doesn't have a lot of backing. Unfortunately, it's been the conservation concern with bats, say in Asia, where we've been implemented into their habitat. People have been capturing bats, bringing them into wet markets, stacking them with other animals where people are crowded together next to these cages of diverse species. And that brings zoonosis. And that's a big factor and is believed to have been how this COVID virus started. So it's not our native bats. It's not you know, getting close to bats or seeing them it's actually in a way kind of abusing them. It has got us in this situation. It's something we're gonna to have to learn from our relationship with wildlife and how we handle the natural world and how we mitigate illegal trade and how we mitigate negative habitat fragmentation to have a better relationship. So we're not in a situation where you cannot see me in person, but now you have to see me 
online. So you know, just something to think about. But let's continue about bats. And so this historic relationship has not been the best. And unfortunately, during that time of the historic relationship, um, it has not been helpful for bat conservation. So a number of bat species are becoming rare. And we have a number of bat species um, within the country that are in danger. And even in the state, we have a number of bat species that are in danger, um, including the little brown bat, the northern long-eared bat, and the Indiana bat. And so what's causing these declines? Well, besides direct persecution, you know, we do have situations where people will directly kill bats. Other forms of mortality can include collisions with wind turbines, habitat destruction, or alteration of habitat due to construction. But in the last couple of decades, the big culprit has been a new disease that has come in, this invasive disease. So recently, bat populations have plummeted due to rapid spread of the fungus causing white nose syndrome. And so this was first spotted in the US outside Albany. And so we can see this area circled here in Albany, New York. And then you can see from there, um, as the red is more recent, blue being, um, say back in the early 2000s, and you can see how this disease has been spreading. And now it's even more seen in the Northwest and it's starting to pop up in areas even getting close to the Rockies in more recent time. And the reason being is spread by people. People inadvertently have been carrying the spores of this fungus as they've been going from cave to cave to cave and they've been spreading it. And so what has been the repercussions for spreading this disease has, has been pretty intense. So what happens, you know, how is this disease so bad? Well, this fungus will actually grow on bats that are in hibernation. Now hibernation is a heck of a balance. So right before hibernation, bats are constantly eating insects. They're getting bulked up. They're getting enough energy reserves to go under hibernation. However, when in hibernation, this fungus actually start to begin to grow on them. And again, this is not a native fungus. It was brought in from Europe, Eurasia. And so while they're in the cave trying to hibernate during this cold winter season where there's no bugs, which they primarily, they primarily feed off of bugs, but they're not, um, since the bugs aren't available, why be active? That's hibernate. But what happens is this fungus, while it's grown on them, becomes an irritant, and it actually causes them to wake up during hibernation. And that greatly impacts their ability to save energy during the winter, because as you wake up from hibernation, it actually takes up energy. And so what actually happens is during the later part of the winter, you actually get bats begin to die because they get irritated. They can't refuel themselves, and they'll actually potentially starve to death because of the spread of this fungus. And this impact has impacted, um, sorry, this impact has spread to a number of different species of bats, including little brown bat, northern long-eared bat, and Indiana bat. And you can see there how numbers have declined dramatically in many of the bat hibernacula in Pennsylvania specifically. So we used to have caves that had northern long-eared bat and no longer. We used to have caves that had the Indiana bats and they're completely gone. And so you can see we're seeing a 91% decline in survey efforts within a five state area, you know, including Pennsylvania, New York, and other surrounding states, that these declines in total population size have been pretty dramatic and have been backed up by uh, um, uh, the biologists here at the Pennsylvania Game Commission, specifically Greg Turner, who's been doing a great job of keeping tabs on these species and trying to determine how large the impact has been. So based on these drastic declines, you've actually seen species of bats now be listed as to require federal protection as well as state protection. In addition, we're seeing bats also be now listed as species of conservation concern. And almost all bats now in Pennsylvania are species of conservation concern, with the exception being the red bat and the hoary bat. But the hoary bat we're kind of concerned about because it's being hit quite a bit by wind farms. So, we have these bats that used to be a lot more numerous. Their populations have dropped dramatically. But why care? Good question. Well, there are many ecological and economic benefits bats provide, including they disperse seeds, they pollinate plants, they distribute nutrients throughout the uh, ecosystem. And so they're actually those, the pollination dispersal of seeds, this is really important uh, for the main, maintaining of biodiversity. In addition, insect suppression directly benefits us. 
to replace the ecosystem service of agricultural insect pest control provided by bats in North America would cost over $22 billion in order of cost of adding more insecticide to those areas. And what's interesting is bat value has a long history. So during the late 1800s, there was actually nearly a war. Actually, there was a naval war over bat poop. So you had Spain and Peru actually went to war over seabird and bat guano because they use it for fertilizer. And this fertilizer made up 60% of the Peruvian economy during that time. And so this was called the Chincha Islands War or the war over turds, literally. Um, so it's um, kind of an interesting history showing how valuable not only these bats to the ecosystems, you know, as far as pollinators, insect control, they'll actually eat other species as well and disperse in seeds. Um, they're actually important for us for insect control and you know, for fertilizer as well. And so again, these bats play an important role. And many people who, especially this time of year, if you're enjoying that margarita, think a bat because tequila comes from cactus and those cactus are pollinated and spread via bats. So the tequila industry is very much dependent on the ability of that pollination. So now our relationship is changing a bit now. We're starting to see an interest and concern in the ecological role of these bats and realizing their importance and we're realizing some of them are pretty darn cute. So people now are switching from this fear mode to more of this interest. People now want to help out with bats. And that is great, especially due to the fact that us as researchers, we are limited in the amount of hours we can put in and the amount of money we have to do some of this research. Um, so bat species are 50% of them have been listed as threatened, 18% are data deficient. You know, if we look at a global scale, not just within the United States. So we need more information on how to save these species and bring it back. So we need more information on resources that are limited to bats and what can we do to help them. And there is even a push too to have the public more involved because the public is growing in their interests in bats. And now we're finding ways where the public can actually get involved in helping us count bats. And that comes into a little project we're doing at Hawk Mountain, as well as some other volunteer opportunities, which I'll talk about a little later on. But there's also small things you can do yourself. So if you do a bats in the house or on the barn, you know, there's ways that you can block the entrance for those bats instead of saying killing the whole colony that's used in your, um, say using your home or whatever type of structure you find bats in. And if you don't want them there, sometimes a good way is to work with a professional to find out where the bats are. And when they leave at night, block the openings so they can't come back in during the end of the evening or later on in the evening. And so thinking about bats, you know, around uh, you're protecting large trees, you're protecting cave hibernaculums, those are good things to do, uh, especially if you're a landowner to help bat species. So this gets us into different types of research. Now we can net bats, put radio transmitters on them and follow them. But a cool thing about bats is this growth of acoustic surveys. We can actually record bat calls and based on that call, determine what species made that call. And I'll go through how that's done. So the benefit of acoustic surveys, instead of doing say trapping, traditional trapping is by doing acoustics, it's not invasive. We're not actually having to stress the bat or have it in the hand. In addition, you can go to an area and survey over and over again with minimal impact and you can get people and other people involved like citizen science is involved. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to expand acoustic survey efforts in the state, kind of document where these bat species occur. And we focus quite a bit on the Kittatinny Ridge, which Hawk Mountain is situated right in the middle of the Kittatinny Ridge in Pennsylvania. So it was a great spot to do work. So what are our objectives of this project? We wanted to conduct passive surveys for rare bats along the Kittatinny Ridge in Pennsylvania, identify where these rare bats occur and then eventually share this, and we have been sharing this information with government agencies so they can use this to, you know, maybe look at other areas that maybe need to protect it to benefit bats. In addition, I want to kind of go over some of the uh, unique work we did at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary with the bat kiosk that we have there and give some description of there and how you can actually visit the Nature Center at Hawk Mountain and, and how to use this kiosk once we get it back up and running again. So the study areas. Well, here's the Kitty Tinny Ridge here in Pennsylvania. And you can see our, 
our study spots were cow, stretched from Cowan's Gap State Park, Boyd Big Tree Preserve, Ford Indian Town Gap. We work with biologists there, Swatara State Park, and then we got Hawk Mountain, and then we go up to Lehigh Gap and Jacobsburg Environmental Center. And so we had a number of different places we were surveying for bats. So how are we doing this? What methods were we using? Well, there's actually a couple of different ways you can do acoustic surveying. One way is what they refer to as active surveying. So that's when you actually go out with microphones, specialized microphones that can pick up those high pitch frequency, those ultrasonic frequency. And you'll have say a iPad or a type, um, you can even have a laptop, but you have some sort of device that's able to get the recordings from the microphone and almost in real time, get those recordings, process those recordings through the microphone. And then you can have say a software program like Sonabat Live translate that call into these figures here and based on the shape of these figures determine the species. And I'll go over how that's done specifically. So you can actively go out, walk a transect, drive a vehicle, record calls and pick up bats at the same time. And what we did was actually a more of a passive surveying. And so passive surveying would be when we actually put devices out in the field and let them record for say a couple of weeks at a time. And then we data was saved and recorded on a device. And we use a D500X device, a Patterson device. And it's all that wave files from the back calls are saved on a hard drive. Or specifically, we used a compact disk drive you know, or a, a scan disk, something you put into a camera, same thing we used. We take it out and we plug it in our computers. And so we set these microphones out in the field. You can see we had that recorder in the box, protected, weatherproof. And this is kind of what they look like close up. And so here's the actual unit. You see it's connected to this microphone here, this specialized ultrasonic microphone. This unit is housed in this protective box. We actually have our memory cards underneath here, and then it'll record for multiple days. So what I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna turn my video off here because I'm actually gonna play this video. I'm gonna narrate for you, but I'm gonna kind of play this video to kind of show you uh, the type of area in which we set up these devices for, um, for bats. So I'm gonna stop my video right now, but I'm gonna start this video, and this is actually at Lehigh Gap. And you can see I found a small tree, but I put the, pole about 20 feet up with the microphone kind of at a 30 degree angle and you notice I have it facing this nice pond area over here and that's a great place for bats to fly over to feed on insects and if you follow the wa a wire down you can see it's connected to this unit here and so I have it off the ground so it doesn't get flooded but that's a nice spot where it's kind of a stereotypical spot of where I would set up a microphone and record data for bats. So I'm going to go ahead and put my camera back on so I'm back with you. Okay, I can get, um, there we go. Excellent. All right. And so how is acoustic surveying done? Well, you can see I had that microphone out in the field and that was specific for bats, but you can set up other microphones for birds, you can put in marine microphones for whales. Um, I actually have set out uh, mic uh, microphones to record bird and amphibian calls. And then what you could do is once you get these audio calls that are saved on a flash drive or a memory card, you can then upload these to your laptop, your personal computer, and then you can get software such as this Kaleidoscope or Sonabat software and you can use that software to parse those calls apart. And these software specifically can do one of two things. They can, they, they'll have species already programmed in that'll help you identify what those species are. Or you could feed known calls of species into the program and you can train the program to identify what species are based on their call. So say I did a call for um, bullfrogs and I have all these calls of bullfrogs. Now I know it's a bullfrog, it's, but all I can do is I can train the program to say, hey, see this call? See the shape of that call? That's a bullfrog call. And I can tell the program, every time you see this shape, 
market as bullfrog. You're like, well, why, why do that? So you're spending all this time to teach the program to identify bullfrog calls. Why is that important? Well, what's nice is if I'm leaving a device out for two weeks, I don't want to have to go through hundreds of hours of recordings. If I just want to identify where the bullfrog calls are, I can push those hundreds of hours of recordings through the software and the software will tell me where the bullfrog calls are, how many of them are there, when were they calling. So again, it really shows you the power of being able to condense that survey time just to focus on the specific auditory calls that I'm interested in. Well, the next question is, okay, well, you can train these programs to do that, but how did other people get this call data, say, for bats? Well, this is kind of a cool project, and bat conservation and management was involved in this. How do you get the correct call data? And what they did is they did traditional trapping. They get traditional trapping, they get the bats in hand, they put a little LED light on the bat, they'd be able to fall off, they'd release the bat, and after the bat is done, you know, yelling and screaming about being handled, they'll go up into the air, but you could see the LED light on the bat, and they'd point the microphone at that bat species they were able to identify in hand, and after a while, the bat will get back into its normal call routine, and eventually the LED light will drop off, say, after several minutes. And so that they do is they do that over and over again and they get a call library. And that call library then, you can go to those WAV files and you can see the unique shape then put together with this call library. And then you can bring in your calls and see what your calls, how they best match the calls in the call library through say a program like Sonabat here. And then you can then get a little bit more complex and kind of go into each individual call to determine, is it really indeed the call that we think it is? So what I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna turn my video off again, but I'm gonna show you in the next video how we use these program in order to determine which species is which based on their call or auditory call. So I'm gonna go here and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn my camera off again. I'm gonna stop the video and that's gonna allow me to play this video here and what I'm going through is I'm going through this Sonabat Live program. I'm going to open a file. You can see I'm doing that there at the top left. So I open this file and you can see it kind of looks kind of like these little fish hook looking auditory calls. Now these are a bat call because they're ultrasonic frequency. How do I know that? Because this is kilohertz right here. That shows me how high pitched the frequency call is. And then I have time over the X axis. In addition, the dark red is the amplitude. It tells me how loud it is. And so I could play this call. And when you hear a back call, you hear, kind of hear if you hear it at all. It could be, it's a really light, really light call. But if you slow it down, it almost sounds like a bird whistle. And so what I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at that kilohertz frequency recorded by that specialized microphone. I'm going to look at time. I'm going to look at that amplitude, how loud it is. And you can see that I can model that. I could put a line over these shapes, look at these three-dimensional variables. And based on the shape and all these three-dimensional variables, it's Aptisicus fuscus or a big brown bat based in that shape. Now let's open another file and you can see it looks very different. You can see here, again, we know it's a bat because it has a very high kilohertz here. You can see over time, you can see how loud it is within each of these calls. And what we're looking at is the pattern of the amplitude, the pattern of the kilohertz over time. And we can see that this pattern is very different. So what we're doing is we're taking an audio file and we're making a three-dimensional figure of this and this three-dimensional figure can, based on maximum likelihood of shape and how similar the shape is to known calls, we can then match it to that call library. And here we could see that this is Periobiota subflavus is the tricolored bat. And so we can then do this for all our calls that we bring in. The programs allow us to identify them based on a really good call library of known species. So that's what we did. You so kind of kind of broke down, you know the areas I went to, you know how I set up my devices in the field, 
And you know, I downloaded the data from my devices, put on my laptop, and you can see this example of a one program I use to help me identify the back calls. So we collected all this data. We did it all through 2019 of last year. Um, and what I'm gonna show you is the results of that survey data from being in the field. Now, the first graph I wanna show you is something called a species area curve. And so there are species accumulation curves. And what I'm looking at here is the number of sampling nights and the number of bat species that were detected. So these are each of our study areas. Notice I didn't put Hawk Mountain in there quite yet. I'll get to that. But for each of these study areas, you could see that some of these graphs, some of them level out and they kind of go flat across the top. When they go flat across the top, that lets me know that species area accumulation curve flattens out. That gives me comfort that we've probably detected all the bat species in that area. However, we got a couple of areas here, specifically if we look at Swatara, if we look at Lehigh Gap, they never leveled off. So those areas are probably gonna need more surveying. And actually I am this year continuing to go out the survey um, of the, uh, these areas using the exact same techniques. Actually Monday and Tuesday, I'll be going to all of these uh, study sites and I'll be putting these bat devices back out to record more calls and hopefully I'll get these areas to level off. So I'm really confident that I got all the bat species that occur in each of those sites. But let's look at the data for each one. Let's start off, I'm gonna start off with the ones that have say the least number of species and then build up to the ones that had the most number of species. So this is Jacobsburg Environmental Education Center. And we need to go back here because this area never really up, leveled off that well. So I'm gonna go back here and I've been surveying this area more and been getting some better results. As you can see, we got two main species that popped up, the red bat and the big brown bat. And you can see we got a lot of hits in big brown bat. What you're gonna consistently see in my results here is the large number of big brown bat calls. We record a lot of them. They dominate, they're the dominant focal species in all these areas. Now, you'll notice I'm saying number of calls. I'm not saying total number of species. I'm not saying how many bats are in each spot. Basically, what I'm doing with this auditory data gives me an idea of the relative activity of these different bats. So big brown bats are very active in all these sites. And in Jacobsburg, our most active bats are big brown and to a lesser extent, the red bat. Now, if we look at Lehigh Gap, we see we got a more species. We actually got a lot of big browns, like I said before. We have red bat, but we also have hoary bat, which are second numerous, silver hair bat, and we got an Indiana bat call, which is a big deal because this is actually a federally listed species. So that was really interesting to get that bat call on the books. And that's something we, you know, we wanna let Lehigh Gap know about. So we have all these different bat calls here within this area. And so Lehigh Gap is kind of a decent area, but what I like about Lehigh Gap is because it's a super fun site. It used to be a heavily environmentally damaged site and they've been putting a lot of effort to try to bring back some native vegetation, grassland areas, and even some forests. And so, you know, we've seen a little bit of these bat species starting to come back. We want to continue to monitor these bat species over time. Now here's Swatara State Park. You can, again, you can see the big brown bats dominate, but we have red bat, hoary bat, silver hair bat, we have Indiana bat, and now we have tricolored bats that also occur here at Swatara. So again, we're starting to increase in number. At Cowan's Gap, we can see a, a good number of species, but what I really found interesting about Cowan's Gap is not only do we see a large number of little brown, which is extremely important because now they're federally listed as well as state listed. This is an extremely important species we wanna to try to bring back. We have one of uh, Indiana, some tricolor, but then we have evening bat. And this was the only site where we actually picked up evening bat calls. So that was pretty cool. The only area, and that actually kind of makes sense because if you remember on the map, Cowan's Gap is the closest one to Maryland. This is our most southern area that we surveyed, and that's where we're picking up more of the evening bat, which has more of a southern distribution in comparison to these other species. Fort Indian Town Gap had great numbers. Now they've been surveying a lot more, and so this data I actually got from the biologists at Fort Indian Town Gap, who did really cool work there monitoring their bat populations. You can see the extremely high number of big brown bats and red, bat, uh, red bats, a lot of activity data there. 
some hoary silver hair. They also had a large number of small footed. And so the small footed bat, that was, they got great numbers for them. And that's extremely important because that's a species of conservation concern. And even more important is their large number of long eared bats. This area had the greatest activity of northern long eared bats, which has just recently been listed as threatened by the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, and a good number of tricolored bats. But you're going to see consistently in all these sites, we mainly had big brown bat as dominating, and then we have these other species recorded in lower numbers. That happened at all sites except for one, and that was Boyd Big Tree Preserve. Now you'll notice it doesn't have the species diversity as the other sites, but the species it does have, it does have a little brown, which is important. But look at the large numbers. What Boyd Big had was large activity numerous bat species. So we had a large number of yeah, big brown bats, but we also had heavy activity from red bats, heavy activity from hoary, hoary bats, silver haired, and tricolored bats. These bats were calling actively, which you could probably, uh, based on the activity level, with, with, the, with heavy activity, which suggests that there's potentially more individuals at this area. And I think a big reason is Boyd Big preserve is specifically there to preserve trees and bats will use large trees during the summer season and spring season. They're using those trees to roost and since they protect trees and large trees in this area, there's a lot of area for these bat and different bat species to roost. So they're very active within that area. If we break down all these figures, we can see a table summary. Um, you could see this uh, area that had the highest species richness. Again, that's the area that had the greatest number of species. You can see at Fort Indian Town Gap and Cowan State Park, important areas for bats. But you know, Swatara and Boyd Big are also pretty important as well. Now what I also show here is a diversity index. So this is species diversity. You know, species diversity is different than richness. What species diversity tells us is, is there an even representation in activity for each of these bats? Or is there one bat species that is more active than all the other bat species? And so what you can see is overall highest bat species diversity occurred again at that Boyd Big, like I was showing you earlier. That had high species diversity compared to the other sites. Now I use two, diver uh, two different indices here just to kind of show you the kind of the consistency in the data that we see here. And so Boyd Big had really high diversity. What that means is it had a pretty decent number of bat species, six, but these six species were well represented, meaning they all were very active at the site. Unlike something that has a low species diversity index here, so Jacobsburg and Lehigh Gap, that was mainly all big brown. So within this spot, and even within Swatara, the vast majority of calls from bats were just big brown. But at Boyd Big, calls came from a diversity of different bat species. So that's what that means. Now, let's get on to the one spot we haven't mentioned yet. What are we doing at Hawk Mountain? And so at Hawk Mountain, we're kind of doing a unique project in that we're actually set up a kiosk where kind of the people can kind of interact with the data, the exact same type of data that I just showed you. Hawk Mount's a great place. It's got a great history for education. It's got a great history for conservation. And so this is a great spot in order to introduce this new um, public interface kiosk that also monitors for bats. And we always thought it's important. It's important to get the public involved and get them excited about the resources in their, in their area. And if you can get citizen science involved and get people involved in helping out scientists gather data, that's even better. And so what we have here is more of a pilot, pro, uh, pilot project with that we were doing at Hawk Mountain and testing this new technology. Now, for other projects, if you wanna become a citizen scientist, there's a number of different things you can get involved with. You can go out bird watching and record your bird calls in eBird. You can go and look for reptiles and amphibians. So this is the Pennsylvania Amphibian and Reptile Survey. And you can, you can go on these websites and even an email if you have a remote camera trap, you can go in each of these sites and record your data, and that'll be used by scientists in the database, which is great. 
We're starting to do that now with our bat data that I just showed you. There's actually a, a site called BatAmp, and I'm actually going to put my bat data on there so scientists around the country can use it. So what are we doing at Hawk Mountain? Well, here we have bat monitoring kiosk for the, pu the public. There's only been one other of these established, and that was way back in, um, that's actually out west at Yosemite. This is actually the first public kiosk at a nature center is Hawk Mountain. And what this is, is a kiosk that is connected to a ultrasonic microphone that is located on top of the nature center. That ultrasonic microphone records bat calls at night. Those bat calls are then recorded onto the hard drive that's connected to this monitor. What people can then do the next day is they can go onto this monitor and see what bat species were calling the night before. And they can see these different patterns, the different call patterns. You can see here that the screen will identify each of these bat species for you. In addition, you can go through, select each of these windows and get different types of information on each one of these bat species. So what we were doing is we're actually using undergraduate research students. We're gathering the data from this kiosk so people could see it the night, uh, the day after from it recording the night previous, but we're also getting long-term data. And so we set this out during the summer of 2019. And this is some of the data we got. We've got, um, we had actually a species richness of six. So we detected six different bat species flying around the top of the nature center. We got little brown bat, which again is endangered in the state, small footed species of conservation concern. And we've got silver haired hoary bat. And you can see red bat, and of course, the dominant species is big brown. Now you'll notice our numbers are small here, but that's because I'm not giving you the total number of calls. These are the mean number of bat calls per evening. And you can see a lot of it's dominated by big brown. But it is really cool to see some of these conservation, these species of conservation need, they are using the Hawk Mountain area. So we definitely want to keep track of that. And we're going to get this kiosk back up and running again so we can keep recording data to see what bats are in the area. Now, if I break this down to a table for the different species, you can see I broke it down by month. And so now what I want to show you is because I'm able to keep the kiosk at Hawk Mountain for day after day after day, I can now get data sets that are a month long where you know, I'm recording data every day for multiple months, we can actually now start breaking down temporal data. So it's not just what bats are there and how active they are. We can maybe now get patterns of, all right, what time of year are they most active? And so you can see here in August, that's when we recorded the greatest number of bat species. In addition, we had the greatest diversity of bat activity during the month of August. Um, and when we started looking at all our results. So that's really interesting. And that could be, you know, during, you know, bats are getting active come May and June. They're breeding during that time or having young during that time. And the young then become out and they're out flying about their parents around that time. And that may explain why we have this spike in richness of diversity or which I'll get into later, it may suggest some migratory patterns as well. So in order to determine that, we're gonna to have to do more research. Again, I'm just hypothesizing, but that's what makes the data fun. As you get to learn more, you start to ask more questions. And so that, but it's all good because the more questions we answer, the more we can do to help bats and understand their ecology, their biology, so we can do more to help them out. So not only am I looking at, say, monthly patterns during the year, I can even look at nightly patterns. So I put all the bat calls together, and I found right at dusk is right when these bat numbers spike really high. And what was interesting is the numbers are really high around dusk, and then, you know, a few hours afterwards. And then they kind of dip down. They have a little peak right before midnight, and then you can see bat activity is pretty low after midnight in comparison to those dusk hours. So that's really interesting. And so I want to get more species specific data on their monthly activity and on their nocturnal activity as far as where they're active. So I thought that'd be really interesting to do. And for conservation, I think this information is going to be really important because it's going to help us determine what the seasonal patterns are for these bats, especially our migratory bats. And this is something that a lot of people know. There's a few bat species within our state that are migratory. So example, Here's the red bat, a real pretty bat species you find in Pennsylvania. But look here, its year-round range is more towards the southeastern United States, 
its summer range is here. So it's not in Pennsylvania year round. It migrates out of Pennsylvania to the southeastern portion of the country. And so it'd be nice is to see what is the timing of this migration? When do rad bats come back and when do they leave? Now, hopefully it can start getting that data from the kiosk. In addition, we can ask the same questions of the hoary bat, which is actually becoming more a species that people are keeping their eye on because their numbers are starting to drop. You can see here, they breed throughout almost, you know, they breed through a large part of North America, but they migrate through the Southeast and you can see they're a non-breeding resident to these small areas here, or they're year round in some, you know, these subtropical areas here where they're permanent residents. So again, what is the migratory pattern of the hoary bat? You know, when is it, um, when does it uh, come back for breeding and when does it winter? And so I think that's gonna be really, really important when we start asking about these species and when they come through. And then eventually what would be nice is, can we get an idea of what type of, my, uh, where, what, where are they moving as well as when are they moving? Because both questions I think are gonna be really important to, to answer in regards to these bat species. So our future efforts, We'll continue passive survey efforts along the Kitty Titty Ridge, which I've been doing right now. Um, let me put my video back on. Sorry, I was blacked out for a while. I apologize about that. Um, so we'll continue passive survey efforts along the Kitty Titty Ridge of PA. We'll record bat survey data from the public kiosk at Hawk Mountain to look at when are they most active as far as time of year and even time of night. And then potentially if we can expand survey efforts, it'd be really nice to see, you know, how they use the uh, landscape for migration. And so there will be more to come in the future. Now, say you wanted to be involved in some sort of bat um, survey effort. Well, the Pennsylvania Game Commission actually does something called the Appalachian Bat Count. And you can actually be a part of this effort. And so this is a citizen science effort. And so this is a community science project um, and this helps the Game Commission monitor population trends in summer bat colonies, especially with this impact of white nose syndrome. You know, where do we still have active bats? And so if you become involved in this PA Appalachian Bat Count Project, your survey efforts will help measure the impacts of white nose syndrome and document the location and size of surviving colonies. So hopefully we can protect them. All right, so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions you may all have Again, I appreciate you all um, spending time with me this afternoon, but uh, let's get a little bit more interactive. You know, I've spoke for a while about what I've been involved with. What questions do you have? And I may not have all the answers, but there'll definitely be questions that if I do not have the answer to, I'm going to go look for it. So I'll um, let you take it, Jamie. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation. All of your research projects are so exciting. And I know that Hawk Mountain is, is thrilled to be a part of it. And tons of questions have come in during your presentation. <laughs> Where did it get? So many to choose from. Okay, um, let's see. Does noise pollution impact bat communication and why are bats communicating? Well, uh, it's, bats will communicate and bats will communicate for the very same reason that other species will communicate. You know, they wanna know who is where and, and, and who are they? Are you somebody unique? Or are you somebody you know? Um, Noise pollution, that's a really good question. I'm going to assume yes, but I do not have the full answer to that. I'd have to look that up as far as the impacts and bat and noise pollution on bats. Um, but what we're picking up on our audio equipment is not necessarily the communication between the different bats and individuals of bats. We're actually picking up the auditory calls they make when they're going to capture insects. So it's mainly their navigation calls and when they're keying in on prey. Those are the calls, and that's why you notice I put the microphone over water more, and that's because that's where you're going to get a lot more insects. That's where the bats are going to be preying on insects more, and so those are more of the type of calls that we're going to be recording. Okay. Thank so. you, Aaron. And actually, another question is kind of, you kind of answered it a little bit, but a, a question came in about the, the, the specific habitat locations where you're doing uh, your research projects. Are these areas where there are a lot of insects, which you just said, and caves. So they're asking about where, where are they sleeping or roosting in, in yeah, these so, areas. Yeah, I'm not focusing on caves because most of your summer roosting bats, most of them are going to be actually not using caves. 
they're going to be using trees, the large trees is where. So I'm looking for um, areas with uh, relatively decent forests that are next to a body of water. I prefer ponds, um, and uh, but th there's a clearing or an edge. So I have one area that say I, I'll put next to a power line over, you know, a microphone or power line area where there could be a creek running along the power line running across, but it's right on a forest edge. And I'm just trying to get bats that are using that edge to hunt for insects because you can maybe catch them better or, or there's a body of water. Other areas, if I have an open canopy, the trees are really tall and I have a water body underneath, I'll sometimes put a microphone there because it's an open, it's open, open enough underneath the forest canopy where the bat can still hunt and catch insects on the wing. Okay, thank you so much. We also had two questions come in about bats in the city of Philadelphia. <laughs> do you know if there are bats in downtown Philadelphia or do you have any idea about the number of bats in the Philadelphia area and surrounding counties? I do not know the Philadelphia area specifically. However, I would bet that there's bats even in Philly. Um, uh, Dr. Dan Ardia, who is at uh, FNM University at uh, Lancaster, has set up some bat devices around Lancaster, and I'm going to actually join them. We're going to do some more urban wildlife interface in Lancaster, and he, we've been picking up bat calls there. So you get the species like big brown, red bat. You know, sometimes even if they're going over across the city, but if you have like say parks that are nearby, some of those bats will roost there, especially if there's bugs. They'll use that area, um, and they'll sometimes, as, as people well know. Even uh, during these breeding months, not only will they use trees, they will use attics, you know, barns and things of that nature. So they will many times use human structures. Now, what is going to be the species diversity or richness within Philly? I have no idea. Um, I'm assuming it's going to be relatively low, but uh, I bet you there's areas in Philly that um, in the city proper, you know, big brown bats, I would not be surprised if they do fly around and light there. All right, thank you, Aaron. So your research is showing that several different species of bats are all kind of hanging out and utilizing the same habitat. How do these different bat species get along with each other? Um, well, I know they haven't, I haven't seen any peace agreements yet um, between the different species. A, a lot of times it'll come, that's the, um, and that's a really good question in the sense, that's why I kind of want to get more data and start breaking down you know, when I look, we showed the graph specifically of when bats are active. So I'm kind of going to that. I want to see if this differs by species. And there has been evidence to suggest this, that different species will be active during different times of night. In addition, you will have different species that forage in different ways. Some will forage higher up the canopy, some will forage a little lower, some will use different types of habitats. So some will use more of the ponds. Some may actually be using more riparian corridors. And so this, there's been, a, especially if we look at the myotis, so there's been a lot of work in Indiana bats showing how important riparian forested areas are for those species because that's where they feed a lot. So there is a little bit of the temporal dynamic, um, a habitat dynamic, and even where in the canopy some of these species will feed. So yeah, so it's, it's not, a peace agreement, so to speak, but there is kind of this understanding and patterns that these species develop that allow them not to compete with each other so they could be more successful at feeding. And we're just shedding, beginning to shed some light on how that breaks down. And some people have done some really cool work and they've been doing it for decades, especially with radio telemetry, but now with acoustic calls as well. You know, what species feed when and where and, and be it a three dimensional structure or, you know, open habitats, more uh, wetland habitats, or within heavy canopy cover of trees. Thank you, Aaron. And the questions keep coming. I have like 16 questions like waiting. <laughs> All right, so we have two questions about migration. So I'm gonna combine them. What is the farthest distance that various bat species migrate? And do you have any info on the timing of the migratory patterns of our migratory bats? Uh, yeah, so I do not have the record for, you know, farthest bat migration. They're not as impressive as birds, you know, overall. The birds are, those are the, the migration capabilities of birds are pretty phenomenal, but the bats aren't bad either. Um, and that's, again, where I want to get more into the kiosk. That's going to allow us to hopefully shed more light onto that question is, when are we seeing the spikes of the bats coming in? and which species is spiking when. So when we look at say, the 
the number of bat calls per evening per species, we can see here it's pretty low in June, June and July for silver hair, and then it spikes in August and September. Is that because they're moving through? Um, we can see what's interesting here is big brown. We see this massive spike during September. And I'm not sure what really caused that. Maybe, you know, maybe the, you know, increase in their activity for, you know, getting ready for hibernation. That could be it. But then if you look at, you know, we got little brown hoary and small footed. We only got during the August season. Is that some, you know, coming back through uh, on migration? And some bats will even migrate to get to their roosts. So they'll migrate across the state to find a roost that they prefer to hibernate in. And so, yeah, migration patterns of bats, I'm not an expert on that. I, I would like to get more information and I'm hoping having a kiosk out there where we're recording bat calls year round will shed a lot more light on this because that, that, that's a really good question to answer. Um, thank you. And I know you were just talking about the big brown bat. Um, the question is, is the big brown, big brown bat less sensitive to white nose syndrome and therefore more common than other species? Or what is the reason why they're the, the most common? That seems to be, well, right now it does seem that big brown bats are more robust to white nose. And you could see, big brown bats have always been relatively common. And the reason is because they do probably of, of the bat species, they're one of the species that do relatively well in human habitations. And so it kind of gives them a, you know, a, you know, habitations pop up, they're able to still survive within those human modified landscapes. Um, so there have always been a lot of big brown bats, but what we've noticed, there used to be a lot of little brown bats too. They actually used to outnumber big brown bats. Hmm. But as white nose syndrome came in, little brown bats dropped dramatically. So it seems that big brown bats are, appear to be more robust to the white nose. And there's some you know, hypotheses of why that is so, you know, maybe, maybe based on the size, maybe based on where they hibernate within the hibernaculum, if it's closer to the cave entrance, which seems to be, they seem to have that a trend where they, they will hibernate closer to the cave where it's maybe cooler and that may impact the fungus. So there's some hypotheticals there that people are looking into and some tentative results suggest some of this stuff. Um, so it does appear though, there is tentative evidence to suggest that big brown bats seem to be more robust to white nose in comparison to especially, you know, the, the other myotis, well, the other species, smaller species, the myotis species like uh, small footed, little brown, especially Indiana bad and, and northern long eared. Um, thank you. So next we have a question from Ingrid who, Erin, she is four years old and watching your program. And Ingrid's, Ingrid. question, <laughs> Ingrid's question is, she would like to know if bats play with owls. Ah. You know, <laughs> bats playing with owls, that can get a little dangerous for bats um, because owls are so much bigger than bats are generally. We talk about barred owls or great horned owls. So usually bats try to avoid owls. Now, the good thing though is bats are pretty quick in the wing because they have really erratic flight. It gets pretty difficult for bats to catch, uh, for owls to catch bats. So. And because bats are mainly going after, maybe they'll make about birds or, or mammals, and some of them will eat insects as well. But generally the way bats hunt for insects, they kind of are able to coexist in the same forest. Um, and they may flutter around each other. Um, and so they may be in the same feeding grounds, um, but they're probably doing their own thing. Um, and, but it, it does appear if you've got, uh, you know, um, good owl populations in a nice robust forest, um, and you have nice large trees there and you have plenty of insects, owls and bats should be able to get along. Awesome. We like to hear that at Hawk Mountain. That's good. <laughs> um, all right. Next question. Is the flying fox a subspecies of bat or is it a separate species that might be related? Yeah. So all these animals that I had data on, these are all separate species. So a subspecies would be like a special population within a species. Um, so the, um, there's the flying fox, there's actually a few species of those. That would be a species that's, and actually that's say a um, family of bat that's very different from ours. So our bat species are what they refer, they're in the family Vespertilionidae. And it's named after Vespers. And why is it named after Vespers? Well, you usually do your Vespers, that's an old religious term, you do your prayers at night. 
And so that's how they got their name, you know, the Latin based name. They come out at night and hunt for insects. Well, flying foxes, they'll sometimes come out, they come out at night, but they can also actually come out uh, during the day as well. And many of those, um, see the fruit bats, so to speak, which the flying fox would be under that group of fruit bats. And so there's a number of different species of fruit bats. So the flying fox being in there, uh, they, you know, they'll come out at night, but they'll sometimes come out during the day as well. And they'll look more, the reason they're called flying fox is because they have more of the fox-like features on their face. Um, but yeah, it's a completely different group of bats than what we have here in North America. But still really cool because they get about six feet long and wingspan. So they're wow. massive bats, really, really big. Cool, cool. Okay, so um, this is an interesting question. Typical acoustic transects occur from June 1st through July 15th. Do you think these should be expanded into August? Um, it depends on what questions they want to ask from those surveys. So the question like I would want to, if I wanted to answer the question of when are certain species of bats coming back from migration or where they live in, or, or when are they leaving for migration, I would say that would be, that would be a reason to expand that survey time for sure, I think. Um, now many would focus on the, they're generally surveying for bats for presence absence, what species are there? Um, and maybe what habitat are they using during the feeding? And so for those time periods, they're mainly going to focus on that narrow window that, you, that your person who answered the question. That time frame they mentioned is the, probably the best time to survey for bats to get an estimate of, you know, how many bats are active in that area, the richness of the bat species, how diverse is it, and in what type of habitats are they using when they're foraging or even when they're roosting. Thank you. Um, light pollution. Does the light pollution play a role in the decline of bat species in Pennsylvania? Um, do we know the population status of bats in more fragmented suburban areas? Um, I'm not sure about light pollution. I would have to look that one up. As is, you know, light and noise pollution, those are two good questions. And I'm not sure what those impacts are on bats. Now I can go out on a limb and say it's probably not helping them, but one could argue with light pollution, if you have a, a light source and it's attracting all the insects, is that a great place for bats to forage in front of? And that's a good, that's a good observation to make. Maybe it is. I'm not sure. I'd have to look into that. Um, so the light pollution, noise pollution, when I'm not sure you know, how detrimental that is to bats, and that may vary depending on the species. Now, there was a second part of that question that I did miss. Um, yes, and I, um, I think it was <laughs> something about, um, do we have information on um, the bat populations in more fragmented oh. areas, uh, maybe mm -hmm. like suburban fragmented areas, is that negatively impact the bat population? Yeah, and so, and so if we talk about human fragmentation, specifically suburban areas with development, um, because it, it greatly impacts trees and foraging opportunities, um, evidence suggests generally within suburban areas, your bat diversity is gonna go down. Right. Um, that said, that's one of the questions me and Dan wanna answer on the Lancaster area is, you know, with these say small plots of habitat, what's using them and which ones are best to protect and so we'd like to actually to set up, you know, bat devices, remote cameras, and survey those areas to see what uses those areas and the areas that have to be the greatest diversity. Why do they have the greatest diversity? And so uh, the trend is generally more developed an area is, at least lower amount of roosting trees, a lower amount of insects, generally going to have a lower amount of bats. The bats we find in North America. Um, but for areas, say a woodlot or a small patch of habitat next to suburban area, what potential does that have? And is it worth protecting? And if you could, how do you connect it with other habitat patches? So though you may have suburbia, if you have large patches of habitat, can bats learn to bounce from one to the other? And can you help maintain bat populations that way? Maybe even expand it to where you can work with landowners to manage the property, maybe put out bat houses or uh, maintain waterways for bat species. So. That would be something me and Dan would like to look at and, and hopefully if people get into wildscaping, they can incorporate bat management as well as providing food and, and plants for birds and butterflies. Thanks, Aaron. And speaking of uh, bat uh, houses, you mentioned, you know, we, Cock Mountain had a calendar of event program that was originally planned for the Saturday Habitats for Bats when we were going to have people come in and have them teach them to make bat houses they can then take home. Um, is that something that people can do 
to help provide more uh, shelter or play, roosting spots for bats to help support the population. Um, it, do you suggest people do that? And there's certainly probably on Hawk Mountain's website, I'm sure if you search bat have, uh, houses, maybe we have some information, but if not, there's you know other online resources that can give instructions and where you can order them. Any comments on that? Yeah, if you're going to invest in a bat house, do your homework, not just on what type of house you're going to um, purchase, but where to put it up, and what conditions should be optimal to benefit bats that use your house. So uh, I know I've done work with bat conservation and management and they have a, um, a good website that actually gives a lot of information on how to put together bat houses, how to purchase them from them, as well as information on how to best set them up. What's the best height, what's the best type of habitat, and things uh, that you know, if you have a if you have a plot of land, where should we put it in regards to the sun to keep warm and things of that nature? So, um, bat house, if done correctly, is a great um, to do. But um, if you don't if you don't do your homework and just kind of put it up anywhere willy nilly, you might not get a good investment in that bat house. Okay, thank you. And I, you know, there are so many good questions, Aaron. They're coming in, and I just feel like I need to put a. Uh, apology out to everyone because I know we're not going to have time to get through all these questions and I keep looking through to be like well maybe I could eliminate some of the questions that aren't so good but they're all good they're all good <laughs> questions um well you're gonna have to do, let's do a few more okay um um okay so someone is asking how do you learn the species of bats that are in your area is there a flight pattern to look for that will indicate the type of bat is there a site or like a bat id book to learn the bat species what would you suggest for people that are trying to you'd be able to identify and learn the bats in their area? Well, there, that's a, a good question. You know, getting bats in the hand, uh, you're probably not legally allowed to do that. And you probably don't want to, if you see one on the ground, just because of the spread of disease, you, will, you, want, you want to contact somebody. Um, you know, if you see a bats, you know, um, in, in a house or, and you would take a picture of them, that's a good way to identify what they are. Some species, I've actually come across red bats that have been hibernating under a leaf of a tree, you know, and sometimes they'll do that during migration. They'll just rest underneath something. And, and you could tell it's, you see a nice orange colored bat and odds are it's probably a red bat. Um, if you wanted to go out and do what we did, doing the active surveys, Wildlife Acoustics actually has a device that you can stick on your phone and you can go out at night and you can put it on conservative settings and it'll actually pick up, it has an ultrasonic microphone that you can attach to your phone that'll pick up the bat calls and it'll show you and help you identify what species are flying around you based on the audio. And so that's by Wildlife Acoustics, it's called Echo Meter. And there's some other companies that make like products, but an Echo Meter that you can attach to your phone is pretty cool. And I have a couple of those in my office and we have used them out We've kind of compared different type of passive devices and um, if we get them set to real conservative settings, you know, make them, you know, um, sensitive to the call, but at the same time, very conservative that they have to fit certain shape parameters, they actually do a relatively good idea, or sorry, they do a relatively good job of picking up um, what bat species are potentially flying around you. Very cool, very cool, thank you. Um, so someone is writing in that they are interested in participating in the Bat Citizen Science uh, program, which is awesome. And so they're asking for the direct link. And Aaron, I think one of the other slides you showed about the game commissions uh, community, they say community, yeah, versus citizen. But yeah, there it is. So that person who asked that question, if you look up, you're going to go to pgc.pa.gov. Um, and then you kind of just navigate that website, you go to information resources, get involved. And then the, the project is called Appalachian Bat Count. Um, um, yep. And then and, and and these type of opportunities will start expanding. You know, uh, our hope is that we can start developing things where we can have people um, helping with survey efforts in the future, which would be great. Wonderful. So how long uh, do bats hibernate? That's a few people ask that question. Yeah, um, bats are surprisingly long lived. So something this and get right about that size can live up to eight to nine years, to 10 years, you know, while a rodent which could be heavier, but around the same size, maybe only have a lifespan of one to two years. Um, and so during the, um, if a bat's hibernating, generally what we found based on the kiosk data actually, 
we found come mid-October, we found a major drop in the number of bat and bat activity, suggesting that bats from about mid to late October are really starting to hit the hypernacular. Mm -hmm. And as far as species rising, you know, that's that's mainly probably going to be an environmental factor. Mainly, you're talking probably, you know, to mid-April. When they start rising, that's a mean time, and it may vary by year based on warm conditions and if, um, you know, insects start becoming active. We've had situations where there's been warm spells, say in February, where it gets up to like 60 some degrees, you get one of those weird warm spells, and bats will actually come out, especially the big browns that kind of hibernate closer to the mouth of the, of the cave. And so, but generally we see that kind of the general trend, I can't give exacts, but the general trend of like, you know, towards the end of October, we see activity greatly decline, and then it starts to creep back up again, you know, towards mid, end of April, when it starts to get consistently warmer and the insects start becoming more active again. And, you know, really, really, you know, becoming pretty darn active in mid-May. Um, thank you so much. And we had someone comment uh, in the Q&A, uh, portion who is actually answering some of the uh, one of the questions someone had asked earlier about the bats in Philadelphia. So someone who is watching this program um, is a volunteer at the John Hines uh, Nature and Wildlife uh, Refuge in Philadelphia and she actually does their bat survey there and she is saying she wanted to share that they have recorded six species of bat in oh, that uh, Philadelphia reserve in the past two years. So Kim Sheridan, thank you for sharing that. That was Yeah, great. that's good. That's great work. Yeah. Um, so Aaron, here's an interesting question uh, regarding white nose syndrome. Has anyone checked into the burning of ethanol in our fuel and its effect on white nose syndrome? It's a known fungus promoter. You no, know, I do not know. I do not know there's efforts now to treat and, and to go into hibernacula and sort of treat antifungal um, compounds you know, that, are, that are relatively environmentally safe and they've been treating hibernacula with these antifungal compounds and they've actually found some tentative success that those colonies that hibernate in those treated caves are actually starting to increase a little. Granted, those results are tentative. But uh, as far as the um, an answer to the question posed, I do not know. That's a really interesting one. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, um, so we have a question about how far, how much distance will a bat travel at night foraging? For how much distance <laughs> from their roost site? Um, again, that'll sometimes vary by species uh, mm -hmm. and sometimes vary, vary by uh, conditions. Is it windy evening, you know, because that could be back could go off with big intentions, but the weather may, you know, turn them right back around. So I wouldn't, um, I'm trying to think of some of the radio telemetry data that they've done with bats and how far they'll move. Um, and some of them can move really far. I know some of the Brazilian free tail bats see, down in Texas they'll go up thousands of, you know, meters, wherever the moths are, they'll go after them. And, and you get some species of bats that'll, you know, move great distances to feed and then they'll move great distances to go back to the roosting area. But how that, those, those, how those average distances break, break down between species, I'm not sure. I know they vary greatly depending on food source, where the roosting site is, and weather conditions. Um, and I wish I had some mean distance estimates to provide, but I do not have them off the top of my head. Okay, no problem. No, you can't know everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, and speaking of roosting sites, we have a question if bats prefer any specific tree species. Oh, they're what well, again, it kind of depends on the um, the bat species, but some tree species that kind of have um, some kind of that flaky type bark are pretty, you know, um, well recommended. So one that always pops up that people mention is like shagbark hickory. Yeah, you know, it's in the, some of those large species, tree species. They really, and there's other species of hickory they'll use as well, where they can kind of hide up into the bark of some of those trees. Um, and so that's a predominant one. I'm trying to think of some others off the top of my head besides the hickory species. But I know those those ones are pretty common. But anything that can provide a robust flaky bark, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be ridiculous. You know, something that's even, you know, 
there's even situations where you have like you know, we've had where they've been up in a cherry you know cherry black cherries have some flaky bark but they're pretty small but sometimes bats can even get up in there um so that's you know robust tree size with some of the flaky bark you know that could work the hickories are known um to provide some of that but there are some other tree species as well but i don't have the list of them off the top of my head i have i do have book chapters and papers that kind of give me the information but uh, i want to don't want to bore you too much with that. <laughs> the data point being the data is out there that, that there are forest management things you can do on your property to help bring bats and having large robust trees that are provide roosting habitat is very important so there are recommendations for landowners to for how they can provide habitat for bats it's definitely out there that's very cool good information to know because that's it we have to provide the habitat because humans are in all habitats of, of wildlife, right? right? Okay, so we're talking a lot about roosting sites now, but going now to the winter for hibernation, do all bats hibernate in caves or can they hibernate in other structures? Um, most of the, the caves are the stereotypical structure used. Uh, and I'm gonna say that there have been documentations of other uh, type of structures being used for hibernation. I just don't know and do not know it off the top of my head. Um, as far as what other structures may be. Um, I've, I've heard cases of using human, you know, old abandoned human structures, mm -hmm. large hollowed out trees mm -hmm. um, being another one. Um, and there may be some others that I've used, but um, it, it, mainly it's caves because of the protection that they provide. And, you know, it, it gets hard for predators to come in and get them during, you know, hibernation. Um, and uh, so, Bats will use other areas to, again, depending on the species, if they can find a spot that provides them safety, it provides them an opportunity for thermal regulation so they don't have to, it's a constant temperature and they're protected from predators as well. And, you know, they all can kind of hibernate together and, because a number of the bat species are relatively social. All right, thank you. And I'm looking at the time and there's just two questions left and oh, okay. like there's a lot, there's still a bunch of people uh, listening. So I want to try to real quickly squeeze in these two last questions. Okay. Um, if I only see one or two bats flying around at night in my suburban neighborhood, does this mean they don't have a colony and they are just loners? No, not necessarily. Um, they can have a smaller, relatively smaller colony, but yeah, it's not uncommon if you're in your backyard to see two, three bats, you know, generally you, you know, most bat species aren't going to have that dramatic exit like we see, say, again, of, uh, long to, uh, the uh, free tail bats down in Texas where they're coming out in thousands all at once. Um, our colonies here aren't going to be as that dramatic in size. Um, so, you know, you'll have, you know, you'll have smaller groups, but they, they'll go out and they'll spread out and feed. Um, so if you're just seeing like, say, two bats in your backyard, um, feeding or just one bat feeding, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that that's going to go roost by itself. It may, but uh, I, I wouldn't make that assumption. No. All right, thank you. And the last question. Um, I, uh, if I am recording NFC for birds, how can I tell if I am picking up bats too, or would I need a specialized mic for that? Yeah, so you're going to need a special microphone for picking up bad acoustics, um, something that can pick up that ultrasonic frequency. So if I wanted to pick up bird calls or, or, or um, amphibian calls, I can use a regular microphone that basically picks up the frequency range of what I'm using on my laptop right now. So my laptop, if a bat was to go by over my laptop, I wouldn't hear it, you wouldn't hear it, and the microphone on my laptop wouldn't pick it up. But if you have an ultrasonic, you know, microphone, specialized microphone that's getting those high pitch frequencies, then you're going to be able to record it with that microphone. So you would need a specialized one. Um, uh, you would to record bats. You would need a separate microphone than one I would use to record birds and amphibians because the frequency range is going to be very, very different. Thanks, Aaron. And can you just very uh, briefly just share with our audience? Um, the website, is it Pennsylvania uh, Bat Conservation and Management, which is, you know, you work with them. Is that a place, yeah. resource? People yeah, so are bat, yeah, bat, yeah, bat Conservation and Management is, is a good resource page. They've done a lot of work. I do work with them. They, they, you know, they work with researchers all throughout the world doing bat acoustic stuff. 
but they also, um, you know, specialize in working with people who have an interest in bats on their own property as well and helping them out. Thank you so much. And I think this wraps it up. And man, what great, fantastic questions from the audience. Yeah, really good questions. They, amazing. And Erin, a fantastic presentation. I know you were busy with the presentation, but you had numerous uh, compliments coming your way through the chats of people saying how much they enjoyed your presentation, how yeah. much you learned. So thank you, Erin, for sharing, obviously, your passion and your expertise with us. And also a huge thank you to our viewers for joining us today. It means so much to us uh, to be able to connect virtually, at least. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, we hope that you come visit us at Hawk Mountain. Our trails are open. We do have modifications in place for social distancing. Check out our website. Um, hopefully our visitor center is still closed. Hopefully it will be open in the future. Just uh, keep checking our website and the bat kiosk that Aaron has been referring to is located inside our main visitor center. Right. Um, and as always, we have many more virtual programs coming your way soon. And this is what's in store over the next week or so. Next Wednesday, July 22nd, we have the Forest of Hawk Mountain at one o'clock. And that's with Steven Ziegler, who's the DCNR Regional Forester. On Thursday, July 23rd, we have Sanctuary Storytime, Friendship at the Feeding Station at 11 o'clock a.m. And then on Thursday, July 23rd, we also have the wind and the water migrating along the East Asianic, Asian sorry, Oceanic Flyway at 4 o'clock p.m. with Camille Concepcion, who is a former Hawk Mountain uh, conservation science trainee from the Philippines. So thank you, everyone. And we hope to see you again soon. And goodbye for now. Have a great weekend. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much for your time. Take care.